Okay, so welcome everyone to Shivali's Books Online. We are the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles, established in 1940. We are gathered here in cyberspace today to celebrate Miss Woods and her brand new book, The Power of Voice, A Guide to Making Yourself Heard. And here with us today to discuss this fabulous book is the equally fabulous Keith David. Keith is a classically trained actor who has won three Emmys out of six nominations and has also been nominated for a Tony Award. Uh, more recently, he starred in the TV series Greenleaf, and you can also expect to see him in the upcoming films Horizon Line and Black as Night for Amazon. Uh, but Keith's main job tonight will be to be in conversation today with our main star and featured author Denise Woods. Denise's um, resume is what one might call unbelievable. She is one of the most sought after vocal coaches in Hollywood, having worked with the likes of Halle Berry, Jessica Chastain, Lawrence Fishburne, Will Smith, Mahershala Ali, who even wrote the foreword for this book. That being said, Shivali's Books is so honored to be hosting these two amazing speakers today. Keith and Denise, thank you so much for joining us. How are we doing? Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to share space with Keith David. So thank <laughs> you, Keith. Thank you for joining me again and again and again. Hey, the pleasure is mine. <laughs> Let's do um, it. Yeah, so to get us started, um, and one of the reasons why I'm so excited about today is that you two are not strangers in any sense of the word. So would you two share with us a little bit about how you first met and how you've stayed connected throughout the years? <laughs> okay, I'll start and then Keith will fill in the blanks because he's notorious, he's the detailed oriented person of the two of us. I sort of give the, the blanket statement and then he comes in and fills in the, the details. That's another way of saying long-winded, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we met when I was 14 and he was 15. We met on my first day of school at the High School of Performing Arts that the film Fame is based on. And um, it was 1972, I was 14. And I walked up to the building on 46th and there are some PA people out there listening. So, you know, I got off the F train at Rockefeller Center and strolled over to the building with my big red Afro, 1972. And he was the first person I saw, the very first person I saw. And I, I was nervous and he came over sort of as sort of like the ambassador of PA. He had the same voice at 15, like really. And I was so unimpressed. He was so trying to be impressive. And I was, I was that girl. I'm like, really? She was just not having it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I tried, you know. Kind of keep it moving, keep it moving. <laughs> and we just became very, very good friends. We ended up going to Juilliard together uh, as well. Uh, and we were in the acting company together, Juilliard's acting company together. And then we did hordes of regional theater productions together. And our families know each other. I know his wife and his children. I knew his mother. He knows my mother. As we were coming on, he was asking me how my sister was doing. So we're family. We're extended family. Anything yeah. you want to add? No, that's about it. You know, it's been a very long, splendid journey, you know. Splendid. From... Uh, <laughs> You know, from those from those high school days, and I've you know watched uh, watched her grow up, and you know become uh, an author. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? <laughs> so I was lucky enough to get my hands on a few photos of earlier on in both of your careers, which I would love to share. And as we take a look at it, um, if any stories come up during these times, please do share them with us. But let's go ahead and take a look. Very earliest one that I've got is this one. So this was, um, oh, whoops. Um, so the Beggars um, in 1978. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about this? Oh, that was a 
third year, right? I think third so. Third year at Juilliard. It's yeah, the Beggar's year, Opera. Um, Eve, Eve Shapiro directed it. Um, it, it it's the, uh, uh, you know, we both started out as singers, uh, you know, even before high school. And uh, here is the first time, I think, it's just it's the first time that as actors in the program, that we also got to sing. You know, we had we had, uh, we had studied, we had we had uh, both vocal lessons with uh, uh, John. I can't remember his last name, but and and uh, we had two Roland Roland Gagnon, uh, uh, and um, here we got to we got to sing for the first time. She, I, I'm playing Mac Heath. She's playing Lucy, and uh, we had it's it's a, oh. it's it's what Mac the knife. Uh, is is based on it's the beggar's opera the the john gay um version of the story and interestingly enough our entire company we were a company of singers we were a company of singers and musicians and so by the time we got to our third year they really looked for a project where we could all sing we had some amazing singers in our company group we eight did, we, did. we really really did and I think it was the first time, I probably can say this safely, it was the first time that they had that many singers in a company, I mean, bona fide singers, because I sang with the New York City Opera, and Keith studied opera and sang um, opera, classical repertoire from the time, I don't know, from, from the time you were- From the time I was 15, when I, I started studying with Dr. Northern, who taught at Carnegie Recital Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I, and- for a long time, I I uh, took I still took a few classes there, but I also, in the first year. I took a I I tried to split my uh, major, and I had a secondary uh, uh, secondary major in voice. You never I, told me that. I had to I had to give it up after because I could only take my voice lessons during my lunch hour. Oh well, uh, well there. And, and, well, I wasn't going to do that. So <laughs> it, it just it just it, you know. That got to be a bit much, but yeah. you know, but, but you know, I got to I got to study with Hans Heinz, mm. who, was, who was you know he was prolific. You know he was a he was a, he was a quite a famous voice teacher at that time. So it's 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 very interesting because, and we'll come back to this that our voice roots um, started with the singing voice. I mean, I right. I can unequivocally say that for me. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so let's take a look at the next one, which we got a little sneak preview of Othello. Mm. Which, mm. before we get to Othello, which started out in the church, the Baptist church, and we'll talk about that because Keith and I both come from the church. We have very deep church roots. And so the church choir really was the precursor, you know, the foundation for all of this. So let's go on. Yes, this is um, the last act of Othello when uh, I, I believe this is right before O oh, gull, O oh, dolt, as ignorant as dirt, which was my favorite line that you delivered. Uh, 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 but this is when she, you know, he find, she finds out that uh, her mistress is dead and he's just killed her. And, uh, I'm playing Emilia. Yeah. And of course he's Othello. It was, it was wonderful. We toured, we toured that production um, to- Florida and off. Our fourth year, this was our fourth and final year at Juilliard in 1979. And we toured, we went to Bermuda. We went, we went all, we went, we did quite a lot with that as fourth year students. Back in the day, it, it, Juilliard was a well endowed school, financially well endowed school, heavily endowed school. And, um, and we got to do a, a lot in, in terms of traveling, in terms of seeing the world uh that because of that mm -hmm. all right and so here's my the last one and my personal favorites because these costumes are fantastic um but we've got the midsummer night's dream <laughs> 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 that's keith and i there as oberon and titania and that's richard howard richard howard a, yeah. who's a year behind us at juilliard he's playing puck and by this time it's in the 80s we're out of the 70s and into the 80s and we have now joined juilliard's the acting company yeah. uh, and richard had graduated by that time so we were all together 
Yes, 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 yes. Richard had just graduated, so it might have been eighty-one, maybe. Um, but but interestingly enough, Keith was the the second African American man in the company because Jim Moody, who was in Group One, was the first mm. African American man male in the company, and I was the first African American woman in the company in nineteen eighty. Um, so so it, it was really really quite interesting because we came in and we demanded that we play lead roles. If you wanted us to join your company, we're not going to be the servant off to the left. I can remember having that discussion. Um, and as a matter of fact, the year I graduated, they asked me into the company and the roles were paltry and I decided not to. And they came back the following year and offered Keith Oberon and me to Tanya and we had a wonderful other, we, he was Orsino in Twelfth Night. Were you Orsino? No, I was, uh, I played Pazzo in, uh, in Waiting for Godot. Oh, you, yes, you played Pazzo in Waiting for Godot. I was um, Olivia in Twelfth Night. Right. So yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a time in, in, in the Juilliard history that, that was just, just beginning to become more conscious of diversity, it, it, it had such a long way to go. By the time I returned to the faculty in the 90s, much hadn't changed between the early 80s and the early 90s when I came back. So, but this was the beginning of it. Wow, um, so we, thank you for sharing those stories. And that sort of, I wanna piggyback on what you said a little bit earlier about um, uh, you starting off in, or having deep roots in the church um, and starting off with singing. And so what inspired your respective careers in the arts? And then where did, and when did you learn to emphasize the voice? Um, Start. I was, I mean, I've, I wanted to be an actor my whole life. Uh, <laughs> I started out, I started out at a, as a singer, um, you know, singing in church and, and my, my uh, father and grandfather they had a they had a social club, and uh, every summer, they would do uh, an, an early and late summer bus ride. During the winter season, they would do two dances, like at the Audubon Club, at the Aud Audubon and, uh, Ballroom, and it was another there was a, and the Rennie, and the, the Renaissance Ballroom. Oh my gosh! Uh, and you know, I mean, during this, the bus ride, for those of you who are not from the New York area, these are all Harlem institutions. Yeah, those are those are big time Harlem places. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we, um, you know, I would sing in the back of the bus when we were going on on our bus rides, and <laughs> you know, entertain the troops there. And 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 I I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, it's funny because I, I, you know, I also by the time I was seven, I wanted to be a preacher. Because uh, my my uh, great great grandfather founded a church in North in South Carolina called um, Jehovah Baptist Church, and my grandmother and great grandmother were uh, always deacons, uh, deaconesses, uh, with the Friendship Baptist Church. One of my great grandmother was a, a, a founding member, you know. Uh, and, you know, so singing, you know, singing was always in the blood, you know, as, as Denise was saying, you know, uh, we, I was uh, in preparing for this, I was asking her some questions about uh, those early days, uh, a, a, a Metropolitan, Metropolitan or Salem, I think, used to host what was the, uh, every, during Easter season, seven of the you know main churches in Harlem would do the seven last words of Christ. And so there would be seven preachers from seven churches to do, and, and uh, my preacher was uh, Reverend Watts. And Reverend Watts, I think, had the fourth word. And Reverend Stamps was my preacher and he maybe had the, the the fifth or the sixth word, which really weren't were a single word. They were statements that Christ said on the cross, but it was an annual event. And it was a battle of the churches back in the day. This was before oh. the mega churches. These were these were the 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 staunch Baptist churches in Harlem. 
and and everybody would come to hear one preacher out preach the other one. And the, the funny thing is, because I said, you know, you know, later on as I got to do um, Green League, uh, because uh, was it at, it was either at Metropolitan, my church, or or one of the, or, or or maybe it was Salem that they had two thousand members. My church. They, that and they would, you know, they have they have to start at eight o'clock in the morning, do eight eleven, and then they have to do the six p.m. Uh, vesper service, you know, because they had to accommodate so many people. But they were not called mega churches in those days. No. Uh, you know that 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 came that came much much later, as as uh, I guess they became more corporate. Well, you know, um, my introduction to the arts started in church, but I grew up on the Lower East Side, the East Village of, of Manhattan in New York City. And man, that was an education. I had access to the Third Street Music School, to the Henry Street Settlement, to the Negro Ensemble Company, um, to, to the New York Shakespeare Festival, Joseph Papp. I would go to the theater before I even got to high school. My mother had a presence of mind to put us in the arts. Um, not to become stars, but she just knew that being engaged in the arts, A, kept us you know, focused and on the straight and narrow, but she also knew that our grades would improve. I mean, we were straight A students, but she knew that there was a there was a real correlation between it, grades and and excelling academically when you put your kids in the arts. And she automatically knew that, and she did that. And little did she know that I would be smitten, and it would become my thing. And 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 we went to see everything. I remember my first Broadway show when I was eight years old, sitting in the balcony, watching Pearl Bailey in Hello, Dolly. Mm. And I can remember sitting there um, in the mezzanine and that brass railing so that you don't fall down. I can remember I was eight looking over, looking down and then the curtain goes up and I'm there like, oh my, I wanna do this. That's when that's when it hit me. The bug hit me on, at a Broadway show, and it was my church that organized all of these mm. events to the Broadway shows. And anytime there was a black show on Broadway or a black event anywhere in the New York area, we had bus rides and tickets to go see it. And it just opened up this world of the arts. And because I was in this this wonderful hotbed for artistic expression on the Lower East Side, it was just right in my in my backyard. And um, and so that one thing led to another. And I and as did Keith, we auditioned for performing arts. And it was over because when I got to performing arts, when I got to PA, I found my tribe. Well, <laughs> and so and, you know Harlem was a big Harlem was was a huge uh, hotbed for the arts and the arts development and yes it was it was uh, um it was a great cultural backdrop to to grow up in because i went to the uh, my first acting school was the harlem school of the arts which was which is which happened to be at the um st mark's presbyterian oh 141st street uh 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue, run by Dorothy Maynor, who was a great opera singer at the time, a great black opera singer. And I was I was in that, that the first couple of, I think it, start, it started maybe 67, I, I came in at like 69 or whatever. And uh, that was my first acting class. And uh, it was it was fantastic, and they and and I went to Minnesink. I don't know if you you know Minnesink, Min the Minnesink Townhouse. Of course, was run by the New York Mission Society, and you know we used to put on play. You know we we put on plays and we put on shows. They had Chuck Davis had the uh, African dance, dance company, dance company, and and I just saw I just saw a really brilliant. Um, uh, documentary on Alvin Ailey. It's wonderful. You got to see it. I've seen it. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, and yeah. And so it there. sounds like once you guys like got your foot in the door for performing arts, you guys just took off. Um, and so Denise, I want to talk 
about you first because you performed in a New York City opera while you're still in junior high school. Mm -hmm. You attended Juilliard as we discussed and performed on Broadway and now you're a vocal coach. Could you talk a little bit about your personal voice journey as a performer throughout the years? Absolutely. I would prefer to talk about my personal voice journey, which really spoke to my professional. I was a painfully shy child. I was, and, and people who know me go, oh, come on, now you weren't. People who knew me when I was very young know that I was very shy. Um, I'm still a bit of an introvert. I call myself a closet introvert. This is learned behavior. When I say learned behavior, it's a part of me, it's authentic, but I learned how to put myself out there. Um, I learned how to put myself out there because when I discovered the arts and I discovered being on stage, I felt more comfortable being on the stage, telling someone else's story, to being another character in front of hundreds of people. But if you got me face to face, one on one, it was so difficult. I, I, I just would shrink. I would go away. I still don't like going to rap parties and opening night parties and because I would much rather be in. And so what I did was I started thinking of myself in terms of me being a gift, a gift, a gift to people when I'm at a party, a gift of, of what I know, a gift of, of, of what I, who I am. And I also got some pointers uh, that I could hang on to that would make me feel comfortable. Some conversation pointers, starters, that would anchor the conversation. And the first question I would ask people, and this is this started when I was in like college, um, after college, when I had to be more out there and away from my tribe. I would ask, where did you go to high school? It is always kind of the marker that kind of levels the playing field gets people comfortable. People start talking about that, those formative years that were either awkward and everybody has a story. Everybody has a scenario about their high school years. So that to me became a really nice conscious uh, um, icebreaker. But the journey was a conscious one to let people see, let people hear, to share what I had. And, and it was so interesting because I would listen to what people would say about me and I would go, really? Well, I don't feel that way. When people would say, Denise, this was wonderful or what you did was great. And I would go, oh, well, oh, I, I really don't, didn't know that. I really didn't feel that. Mm -hmm. I had to really start doing some personal inventory and really reevaluating my perception of myself so that it wasn't rooted in what other people saw, but I really had to sort of see what the world was seeing cause and own it and be okay with it and not say, oh, thank you. Oh, no, 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 that's not, oh, and go, yes, thank you. Own it, live in it and, and embrace it. Um, so when I started doing that, that's when I found my voice. And that's when the, the, the professional world started uh, um, the, the, the voice in the professional context started becoming more palpable for me. Yeah, and I mean, and then Keith, you've won three Emmys for narrating, you know, Ken Burns' documentaries. You're obviously well known for that silky voice that you have. Um, did you also have a journey coming into your voice or how, how has that grown over your career? All of us have journeys to, you know, where we are now, you know, I mean, I've, I've always had a voice of some kind, you know, some kind, mostly, uh, uh, as I said, mostly, you know, uh, when I first started studying, I started studying singing at, uh, formally at 15, uh, right after, and that was after, because uh, I started studying uh, acting at 12 at the Harlem School of the Arts. And I had two sounds, <laughs> loud and louder. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and that was and that was about it and the first uh, my first singing teacher dr chauncey northern who was just an extraordinary human being 
Um, he started, he really started my journey out because he started, you know, I started studying classically. And he's the one that taught me that um, you, 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 you want to train your voice so that it reflects the nuance of your thought. Uh, which was also something that my voice teacher at Juilliard, uh, Robert Williams, uh, also uh, cultivated in terms of one speaking voice, and and, and Robert would say you, that that you, you know you, you your your voice should reflect the nuance of your thought. Dr. Northern would talk about you need to be able to paint the pictures in your mind. Yeah, and sing the you know the the, the 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 visions that you have in your mind about whatever the story of this song is, you should be able to reflect that in your voice, and therefore it has to have some uh, flexibility, some versatility, and uh, and that's when I I began to think, oh wow, you you really have to train to do this because you know you know no matter what no matter what ability you have naturally. Uh, and and many people are wonderfully gifted, but you know, and and God gives you that, but you know, you know, God helps those who help themselves. You got to take that God-given thing, and then tend the garden. God gave you the seed. Now you got to tend the garden and take care of it, cultivate it, so that it's it's more than just what you were born with. It becomes you know a wonderful instrument that. Mm. It, Ex expressive uh, and 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 can reflect more than just you know the limit of your personal experience which is mm. also part of you know the journey of an artist because as an artist uh yes i want to you know be able to tell my story but i also want to be able to tell the stories that are inside of me that uh reflect the rest of humanity around me you know, I mean that, that you know that every man part because they're, I, you know, I have I have I have within my scope the ability to tell many stories and not all of them come from my background or look like me. But I should be, but you know, I want to be able to tell their stories and you want to be able to tell that vocally as well because everybody doesn't talk like me. So you know, and that's you know the the, uh, the, the journey that Denise is on, uh, being able to help you find that it's a it's a it's a great thing because you know one of the, one of the other things that you know i think that, that we would you know uh, learn to julia i mean uh, uh, edith used to talk about you know how different uses of vowels can reflect personality so you know there are people who use lots of short sounds there are people who use lots of long sounds there are there are people you know the the the, 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 the way people form vowels and and use and use different lengths and vowels all those are wonderfully great information that you can use to build character absolutely absolutely uh i i like to say that because i i think you're we're segueing into your next question um, Teresa, which if w I know your next question, but why don't you ask it? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so you, you've, you've both already touched upon this, um, which is, are there specific tips that you can share with our audience about being confident communicators and about being heard? And Denise, you would like to go first. Absolutely. The, the basis of that question is confidence. That's what all of the technique is. I, I have to say that the, the, the impetus for me writing this book happened when I was watching a news program and it was a pivotal program. It was the, the night, the evening news when we all found out that Trayvon Martin had been murdered and his parents were there, microphones shoved in their faces and the world was privy to their pain, their anguish. And now they have to express themselves through all of that emotion. And that's when it hit me that I had to take my God-given gifts and talents out of Hollywood and bring it to everyday people. 
just so that people understand the capacity that they have when it comes to their voices and the ability to use them. And so that moment, that catalytic moment and series of events that have been exacerbated time after time after time in our history, recently with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, every single time I'm constantly reminded of the need for us everybody to express ourselves, to use our voices, be it one-on-one -on -one or on a social, spiritual platform, it doesn't matter. The ability to use our voices are more important now than they ever have been. But the basis of this is confidence. And so how do you get that confidence? This is what I know to be true. That nobody knows you better than you. Am I right? Nobody can talk about you better than you can. I don't care how close they are to you. No one knows you better. No one knows how to convey you better than you can. So therefore you become the expert at you. And when you're expert at something, that's what gives you confidence. That's what Keith was talking about. I think it might've been before we even um, uh, tuned in because we showed up earlier and we were talking and Keith was talking about what gives you confidence is research, is, that, is doing your homework. You know, you're, you're, you're confident in the fact that you know a bit about the subject and then you're able to let it go. You don't just hang on the research that you've done. You now let it go. Well, I contend that's the same thing that you must do with you. You don't hang on to your pain. You don't hang on to the triumphs, but they're there. They inform you. They inform who you are. So you're the expert at it. So use your narrative, your story, and tell it like an expert because nobody can tell your story better than you can. And then what you need to do when you now have the confidence to tell your story is to learn some breathing techniques so that you can fuel the voice with breath. Go, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize people are telling me. I didn't even realize the importance that breath is to voice. I say breath is to voice what gasoline is to a car. If you'd, I can, you can be driving the most expensive, most beautiful car, but if you have no gas in it, it goes nowhere. And that's what breath is to voice. If you don't breathe, you have no voice. And so it's incumbent upon you once you realize that I've got this vocal instrument, as Keith said, and I agree, it's an instrument. I should fine tune it. I don't need to necessarily change the authentic sound of who I am because we are the sum total of all of our experiences. We wanna to add to them, we wanna take away from them. We just wanna have choices of when to use, when not to use it, when to add, when to take away because all of that, my friends, give you confidence. And that's the bottom line. Yeah, and so do you have any specific tips that you wanna share about in particular, again, segueing from what you just said, being heard as a woman or as a BIPOC. Keith, do you want to take this? I know that you, you can't speak for the female voice in the room, but since I was talking, I just wanted to throw it to you. You can certainly speak as a person of color. Uh, yeah. Um... pausing because there's a, there's a it, it, it opens up a whole big kettle of cats let me just stick to what we're <laughs> get to uh, 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 you know tangen tangentially political about it however uh you know we cannot we cannot uh, be afraid of who we are what we are uh, and there's, there's, there's you, you know, you, we must embrace whoever we are, whoever we think we are at the moment. That's right. And whoever we That's decide right. we, that we want to be. And we, and how, how, you know, how else do you express that is with your voice. Uh, and so the, the developing our, vo our voices, uh, confidentially and you know you know in the con in the contents of getting the confidence to be able to speak up for yourself that's um you know you know 
that's cross cultural. That's that's uh, you know, um, that's something that we have. It's cross generational. Mm. You, know, you you know, for years you've you heard of us speak up for yourself, talk for, talk up for yourself, and it's something that that you know uh, we certainly have been doing as people of color uh, is trying to make ourselves heard not just you know vocally but you have to you know the you know you know you it's it's it starts with your little community and then it has to go to the greater community and you want to be able to do that and 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 sound confident like Absolutely. you not, not only that you know what you're talking about but you've thought about it You've, you, you, you know, there, there's been, there's been, there's been lots of wonderful, you know, uh, um, information that you've gathered that is for the greater good of everybody, and using your voice well helps everybody to f to feel that. You know, you you uh, you're able to pass on that confidence, you know, because you know. For, you know, it doesn't matter what you think, as we have been seeing lately. There is somebody else who thinks just like that. Now, that that's good thoughts, bad thoughts, ugly thoughts. You know, you know, uh, how whatever whatever those thoughts are. There's somebody who agrees with you. You and you, if you want to gather, you know, those and rally, you know, those kinds of that kind of power around you. You want to have a powerful voice. Absolutely, I I say that voice is vibration. And when we talk about, I get a good vibe from that person. I, I, I get a good vibe. That person, get, I, I'm getting some really good vibes. It's vibration. That's all voice is, is vibration. And so how do we want to vibrate that energy into the universe? How do we want to put that, your energy, your vibration into the world so that you can be heard? Because like Keith said, we all have gar garnered so much information, sometimes trial by fire, sometimes just being a student of life. You know, we all have so much to share that we can all benefit from. And so the ability to use that instrument and hone it, feel confident about it because you are the sum total of where you come from, who you are, who your grandparents were, who, uh, uh, how you identify sexually, what you, whatever your sexual orientation is, all of that is a part of you. It's your voice print. It adds to your voice print. And there are no two voice prints that are alike. I say voice prints are like fingerprints. There are no two sets of fingerprints that are the same. There are no two voice prints that are the same. I know for a fact that people in the same family can end up sounding completely different. I know I sound different than my sister does. Keith sounds differently than his brothers do. And, 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 it, and, it, and it didn't have, and it doesn't have to do with our training so much as it just how we identify our personalities. And so, I want to convince people that it's all good, that you don't feel, you shouldn't feel that you gotta throw off the baby with the bathwater. And clearly are there some quirks and ticks, vocal ticks that could be uh, adjusted so that it doesn't take away from the story? Because the bottom line is the story is the star guys. Like Keith said, like we've been taught the thoughts, the images, the story, that's the star. And we want to be able to facilitate it. We want to be able to facilitate it. We want to be able to bring our oomph, our spice, our mm to the story. Well, now, clearly, that's if you're a prof if you're if you're a professional actor, it's another, it's one way. If you're an everyday person, it's another way. What were you gonna say, Keith? And we all have you know, we all have a message to uh, communicate, and you want to be able to co communicate that as clearly and responsibly as possible. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, like that's one of the interesting points of this book is you talk about the voice as a tool, um, but also using the voice as a way to demand change in the world. But I do want to um, move on a bit into talking about. I'm sure we have a lot of 
current performers and future performers in our audience, especially in Los Angeles. And I'm sure they're very eager to learn um, what tips would each of you share in terms of how to best use their voice or vocal techniques that will help them in their career? I can start by saying that the very first elements for me for vocal training is first relaxation, relaxing, learning what relaxing is, relaxing the instrument. Uh, the Alexander technique is amazing. Learning relaxation, but also utilizing breath as a tool to fuel the voice so that the voice is supported by breath. Those are the two anchors uh, in, in terms of the beginning of vocal training. And then what you wanna do as you start becoming more proficient in the breath work and relaxation and releasing the voice on the breath, then you wanna learn the, the techniques of storytelling. Like, like Keith says, he's talking about the thoughts and images. We don't just speak words. We don't speak sentences. We speak thoughts and images. And how those thoughts and images are conveyed is by vocal melody, vocal inflection. And so what gives the depth of inflection in your voice is the images that you see in your mind's eye, in your imagination. So if in fact the word blue is on the page in your script, you don't see B-L-U-E folks, you see a blue sky or a blue ocean, or the color blue, or a blue crayon. So, so images are important for us. We don't see words, we see pictures. We don't speak sentences, we speak thoughts. And what, what connects one thought to another thought is a breath. One thought is the springboard for the next thought. I say, if this thought is Manhattan and this thought is Brooklyn, look at your breath as the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> and I would just say you know, um, anything, you know, uh, any certainly, certainly physical exercises, you know, doing uh, martial arts, especially mm. uh, swimming, anything that is that puts you in touch with your breathing. Yeah. Uh, that, is, that, that is the that is the, you know, the baseline because it all it like she says, it starts with the breath. Uh, so anything that gets you in touch with your breathing will help you when you start uh, applying that to the work. Uh, and getting in, you know, you know, you can get into any number of vocal exercises, both for singing and for speaking. But it starts with the breath and your ability to breathe, to be, to be become aware of the breath, where the breath uh, comes into your body, how deep it comes into your body, and and how that and how that influences the relaxation. Yes, because you do want you do you know you do need to be able to uh, be in touch with when your body is relaxed. I mean, you know, some you know some, that, that for all of us, even with experience, you know, there are certain parts of the body that get more uptight than others. Mm -hmm. How do you use your breath to get to those parts of the body that tend to be uptight that keep you from being the most expressive? Yes, that's the bottom line because the lack of breath and a tense instrument will compromise your ability to be expressive. You know, you know what happens when you tighten up the valve on a, on a violin or a guitar, the string, you know, when you tighten that string up, the pitch goes higher. And, and, and great, great producers use those stringed instruments and those high pitched sounds to let the audience know that a tense moment is coming up. And so the same thing holds true with the voice, that higher pitched, higher strung kind of sound, it gives the audience a tense kind of feeling. And when you wanna invite your audience in to receive your voice, to receive you, to receive your essence, listen to, listen to my voice, listen to Keith's voice. It's all about relaxing, Breathing in and letting the voice release on the breath. Yeah, and we actually have um, a couple questions from our audience um, and something I'm curious about as a non-performer myself, which is, um, do you have tips for people like me about improving 
in situations where voice is critical, um, such as job interviews or Zoom interviews like this one, um, or just about public speaking in everyday life in general. Keith, would you like me to take it? I'll, you... um, it's all, I mean, it, 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 it's always beneficial to study, to get in touch with what, you know, your, 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 your body and your instrument. Where are the resonators? What, uh, what helps you to sound more? What, what, what can you do for yourself to make you sound more relaxed? And there are very, there are, there are many, many, many exercises. She has some in the book. Get the book uh, uh, um, uh, that you can do to begin to wake up the resonators, and 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 once those things are you know uh, uh, open and relax, you begin to sound more confident. You begin to sound more like you know what you're doing. You begin to sound like you enjoy what you're doing. You know because you can be you can be you know the smartest person in the room, but if the as she was talking about that you know if there's some tension somewhere in your body it can it'll it'll reflect in the voice that that small reflection can sound like lack of confidence it doesn't have to necessarily mean that but it can sound like that and since we're that's how we're communicating well i don't i, I may not i may not know as the uh interviewer you know what i'm what i'm picking up on but that that little bit of tension can be a little bit off-putting absolutely you know and and if, and if you're in you know just like sometimes uh, somebody who's terribly wonderfully relaxed and 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 they are they are totally on the make they're, they're, they're totally fooling you but they sound like they know what they're doing <laughs> you know because because there's some there's there's a, a, a degree of relaxation in what they believe they you know what they 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 know, they know. If you know, they believe it, it, it. You know, it's so if you think so. Interesting. There are exercises in the book, but I really geared this this work toward the everyday person who will say, "Well, who's got time to do exercises in the morning? I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I'm I'm rushing from this meeting to that meeting." What the book and what Keith and I are talking about is an awareness. First of all, an awareness that that clearly, if if I'm studying an instrument and I want to become a world class musician, I'm going to study uh, uh, hours and hours a day. But what if I just want to pick up uh, the 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 guitar and learn a song for Valentine's Day for for my loved one? What do I have to do then? And so this is the kind of work that I have for people who really want to put in the work who really want to put in the work because they want to hear a difference in their voices because they have always been um, in some way, I don't want to say ashamed of their voice, but they displeased with the way they sound. This is, this is the book for you. When you have just always said, I want to do something about it. I have heard my voice on, 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 on a voicemail and I go, oh, now, I sound like that because people ask me all the time, why is it that when I hear myself, I don't like my, what I hear? And I say, it's the same reason when we walk by that mirror and we look in the mirror and go, oh, where did those 10 pounds come from? You know what I'm talking about? You know, because we see ourselves in one way. And then when we really see ourselves, we go, oh my gosh, it's holding up that mirror to ourselves. The same way when we hear ourselves, we're holding up to the mirror of how we really sound. And, and then you ask yourself, does this sound really reflect who I am or the totality of who I am? Does it just reflect one aspect of me? Does it only reflect the aspect of me that comes from Brooklyn? May, I'm so much more than that. So maybe I would want to add something more to the vocabulary. And basically what I'm saying is that the vocabulary becomes a box of 64 crayons as opposed to a box of eight. You have choices. Now with a box of 64 crayons, you've got five shades of green. You still have the green crayon. Nobody's taking the green crayon away. We're just giving you more options to put into your, your toolkit. So that if today, this week, I say, I just want to work on getting my voice placement forward because it's in the back of my throat and I have vocal fry. Um, that's when you're sounding like you're a piece of bacon is frying. 
And um, that kind of voice can be distracting. It can take away from the narrative because the voice is back here. Or say, for instance, like you're, you're doing everything up and there is this up speak, there's this way of speaking and it can be distracting because there's a certain rhythm and inflection. And I know I'm getting on your nerves already, <laughs> just doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but but there are there are ways to to sort of augment certain habits again not to change your authentic self but in the ability to make the story the star in the ability to make the story shine i say the story is so much more important and so much more interesting than you are expanding your horizons expanding there you go and and and, and yes. much of this uh, much of this vocal work is about ear training because yes you have, to, you have to be able to hear if you don't if if there's something you don't like about your sound what is that can you identify it that's right uh, and then can you ident can you can you hear what you like to sound if you hear something that you like is that something you can imitate until you can make it your own I mean because you know, uh, the worst imitators in the world, you, you sound like you're trying to sound like somebody else. Once you make it your own, no one will accuse you of trying to sound like somebody else. And if you're going to steal, steal from the best, you know, <laughs> find somebody who sounds you like and try to try to figure out what that is and then get, you know, get the book, do the exercises in the book. And I do. I talk about that. I said, find your superhero. You talk about what? I talk about that. Find a superhero. Find some some a voice that you like. You go, that's a nice voice. And clearly, I don't recommend that you imitate it because I just say emulate it. You know, find out and and because what that does is it helps with your ear training. What are they doing? What is it that that you like about that voice? Why are we talking about this? I know people say, what is the big deal with your voice? It's a huge deal, my friends. It's such a huge deal. And particularly now that we are masked up, okay? We are masked up. This is how I, I'm, I'm in a mask. I wear dark glasses and I wear a cap. So I've got the cap on from here, glasses on from here, mask on from here. You can't see me. I have a complete shield over my face. All I have is my voice. All you have is your voice right now. People can't see your eyes. They can't see, they can't see the smile. A lot of our vocal cues are visual. You can see what I'm saying. Therefore, it helps you to hear what I'm saying. You can see the shape of sounds right now. So therefore it helps you to hear it. But when you don't have that luxury, so when you don't have that luxury of seeing me, and you can't hear and voiceover people know what I'm talking about because they're constantly being told, put more smile in your voice. So you know the difference between this and this and this. You've got to be able to use your voices more liberally, more um, um, mellifluously. The range, you've got to find vocal range. You've got to be able to use them because now we don't have gestures that, you know, the, okay, so if I did this, I don't have to say anything, right? I can't do that anymore. I have glasses on and a mask. You can't see that. So I have to put it in the voice. Or if you're on a Zoom call and we're in boxes like that, how do you, how do you stay engaged? And I'm doing it now when the energy drops, how do you top that energy and come in and, and make it interesting so that we don't just zoom out and you know we zoom out in these zoom meetings how do you take the baton and pass the baton and take it as if it's a relay and you take the baton and carry it across the finish line that's energy that's vocal power and there's power in it folks and and i love this keith loves it you can hear the passion in our voices and you can love it too you must love it too it's a part of who you are just like people go to the gym, I mean, people stay in the gym out here in California. 
<laughs> you know, because we're working on the physical. Now I work out not for vanity, but for health, pure health to get this cholesterol down. You know, you're those of you who are at my age, you know what I'm talking about. It's pure health and not vanity. But there's a lot of vanity when it comes to being in the gym. I say, and that's about the physical. Let's work on the vocal as much as we work the physical perception. Let's work on how we're perceived vocally as well. It's just as important as how we're perceived physically. Yeah, and we're almost at the end of our hour. So I do want to get to some audience questions. Um, the first one is from Greg R. He's asking, Denise, how do you teach your students to go out of their own way and live in the copy? Uh, Images, images, as Keith was saying, it's, it's first of all, backstory, who, what, when, where, why, you've got to ask yourself, you know, certain questions, you've got to become a detective, you've got to give the, the, the backstory, I say that the words on the page are just the tip of the iceberg. That just that tip, you see that little triangle right there, just the tip. There's a whole iceberg of information below the surface that we as actors, as artists now have to fill in. And who am I? Where am I from? What's my backstory? What, you know, so that the words become pregnant and full of information. Now you don't play all of that. It all that information does is informs you. You know, you can't play, well, my father died when I was five on this one line that says, hi, how are you? You know, but it's just, it's just backstory. And it and it gives this wonderful um, fullness to to your words and to your character and 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 to your delivery. Would you agree, Keith? Yeah. Yes, I would. I mean, you you you, um, you you must become a detective, and see what the playwright gives you, and then make it up. You mm. know, and then, use, your, yeah. use your creative imagination to make it up, and see how, see how wonderfully you can psych yourself into believing the reality that you make up. Mm, that's beautifully and, said. And, uh, uh, I will believe what you tell me to believe until you betray it. You better go. Um, this, yeah, this is um, another question from our audience member. This is for Keith uh, specifically asking, can you talk about not being perfect during your recording sessions? And he sure it'll make us breathe all better knowing that even you um, take I'm a few kidding. takes to get it right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I work very, I, I, I this is the way I work. Uh, one of the reasons why I like to, you know, sometimes, you know, you can wear cans or not. I know that what I'm intending will be heard whether I'm hearing it or not. I like to hear it because then I can correct myself. Because there are many times I'll, uh, I'll be working uh, and the producer or the director will say, oh, that was fine. Thank you. Let's go on. But I know it, that was okay. That was okay. It was it was it was clear. But I have a clearer one in me. So if you give me the shot, I'm going to take that chance and be clearer about it now, because I can hear it. Some and sometimes sometimes it's just in a little inflection. So I'm going to I'm going to take the time to do that. Uh, many times you're in a, you know, if people are in a, a time crunch, they only want you to do it once or twice. For me, I have to insist, I must do that one again. Thank you, please. Now, even, even, you know, and then there, there are times when I think, I, oh, that was just what I wanted to hear. They'll still say, give me uh, the first two words from the first take. Give me the second two words from the second take, blah, blah, blah. Because that's another subjective thing. But I think you have to satisfy your own ear. You have to go. You have to go for what you think is the is is the rightest, at this moment, because I mean you know, what you what you know what you go over in your room the night before if you do your homework, and you go over it so nicely, you know you, mm -hmm. def you definitely want to hear you definitely want to get the point. You're always looking for what's the operative word. 
what is what is the what is what are, what is it that you're trying to communicate and are you doing that are you doing that to the best of your ability in this moment because tomorrow yeah. tomorrow after you go over it again or even even after, if if it's a if it's a whether it's a, a, a one page piece of copy or it's 10 pages once you get to the 10th page you're going to hear something from the last sentence of the 10th page that is going to inform that first sentence of the first Oof. that you couldn't have heard before. Even if you've gone over it, and you should have gone over it. But, you know, there are times when you have to do it cold. I, I prefer not to. I prefer to have it in front of me so I can go over it. But at that, at that first of all, uh, you, you, your voice also... Uh, settles into a comfortability so that's another reason to go back and do it again but mostly it's 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 a point of your understanding you will come to understand in the in the in the through line of the story that you're telling there's going to be a point of understanding that you get to by the end that you didn't start with because you couldn't have known that until you've put it in your body and once it filters through all that, and you, and you go, oh wow. I, uh, I think I think instead of I mean it made it you know the first sentence it, it made sense that's why you were able to go on, but now I can make more sense. This is a wonderful piggy wonderful way to piggyback for people who have public speaking engagements. They're not public speakers, but they have to give a a, a toast or or a keynote speaking event that they are now the keynote speaker. What Keith is talking about in, in the context of acting and voice acting in, in the larger context for everybody is a story has a beginning, a middle and an end. And there's rising inflection and crescendo in the middle and then we finish with, with an end. And along the journey, Keith is saying that there's a lot of information that you get toward the end of the journey that you didn't have at the beginning of the journey. But the wonderful thing about taking the journey and making sure that it's there's a beginning, a middle, and an end is that you stay in the moment. You go in the moment, moment to moment. And I like to add that in the moment, in the storytelling, verbs and nouns are your friend. Not to say that adjectives are not. But it's, it's these, these strong verbs, the action of the story and the nouns, which is what the story is about, that really anchor the story. It's the strong notes in a music, in, 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 in a composition. A composer makes the strong note and it's the weak notes around them that give the strong note strength. And so we don't want all of the words to be important because if everything is important, nothing is important. The verbs, the action, the nouns, the story, and then the weak, weak sounds and vowels and words support the strength of the story. Wow, um, it's so interesting because obviously my realm of expertise is literature. Um, and so much of what you've been saying in the last hour is so exactly applicable to writing. Um, and I think it's a very common um, error too in which beginning writers, they try to make every sentence the sentence or meaningful or impactful. And in the end, you get fatigue from, from reading something like that. Um, we are a little past our hour. I'm sure everyone agrees that we could probably listen to the two of you for even longer. Um, but I'm sorry to say that we are going to have to say goodbye. I did want to end um, with a comment that someone left, um, a Robert Yakko. He says, not a question, just a huge bravo and bravo from a classmate. <laughs> Wonderful to be here with you. Group eight is in the house. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Robert also says that whenever he's talking about a show or a song, he also says the story is always the star. And he thanks Denise for putting that out there. And thank you to Keith for tending the garden. Uh, the tending never ends. <laughs> so on behalf of Shivali's books, I want to give you a very, very warm thank you. Um, you have both been so fabulous and thank you for taking your time. 
sharing your wisdom with us. I do want to mention again, if you haven't yet, order a copy of The Power of Voice. You uh, can get a signed one from uh, Shivali's books. <laughs> um, what are you saying, Keith? Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the link is in the chat box. Click on it. Get your copy. Denise and Keith, again, thank you. Thank Do you, you have any last words for us before we say goodbye? Keith? Don't stop. Don't let anybody stop you. Your voice is unique in and of itself. It belongs to you. No one, no one can do what you can. Absolutely. And, you... I, and I say it's a gift. When you think of when you think of giving someone a gift for their birthday or for Christmas, you the, the time that you put into getting the right gift, the right card, is is it can be time consuming, but so worth it when you look at the look on their faces. When they open it up, I say, look at that Tiffany box. Your voice is that blue Tiffany box, folks, with the white ribbon on it. Open it up and give it to the world. Amazing. Thank you both again. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you Thank for joining you. us. Thank Buy you. Buy the book. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.